right there. Thank you. Whoever's, who, whose ever job it was to remind me. Thank you. All right. Well, I cannot find the whiteboard, so we're going to have to do it the old fashioned way. We can do it with, with Word. So here's what we're going to do. All right, I'm going to share my Word screen. Oh, there's the whiteboard. Okay, that'll work. All right. Um, so the question is, what is the demand for labor? Okay. Um, actually, I think it might be better to use Word here because my I'm not feeling particularly artistic. So let's get rid of that and we will share my empty Microsoft Word document. Okay, here we go. So, so the question is, that is not the question. Let's scroll down here a bit. The question is, what is the demand for labor? Okay, the answer is, what is a worker worth to her employer? The answer is marginal product, marginal product times either the price of the product if we're talking about a perfectly competitive perfectly competitive output market okay so again if a worker, say, produces four widgets per hour. That is their marginal product. And the firm can sell those widgets at $3 per widget. Then the, the employee is worth $12 per hour. Okay, that is what they're worth. The firm will pay up to $12, but no more. If they, if they pay less, they'll make more of a profit off of the worker, but in no circumstances will they pay more than that, okay? We know that in the real world, there are very few examples of perfectly competitive output markets. And so it is much more likely that the firm is operating either in um, a monopolistically competitive industry or an oligopolistically or an oligopoly or even a monopoly. In those cases, the principle is very similar. The worker is worth marginal product times the marginal revenue of the product. Okay, here's the thing. You hire an extra worker, they produce this many widgets per hour. In order to sell those widgets, you have to lower the price. But you don't just lower the price for these extra widgets, you lower the price for all the widgets that you're selling because you, you, we're not allowing you to price discriminate here. You have to charge one price to all your customers. So what that means is, the value to the firm of the marginal product is the marginal revenue. Okay, so in this case, okay, so let me go back a step. What does, what does 
the demand for labor look like? The demand for labor is the marginal product times the price or the marginal product times the marginal revenue. In the, the simple case of perfect competition, we know the marginal product is a downward sloping line. As you hire more workers, you run into diminishing marginal productivity. You take those marginal product numbers and you multiply times the price of the product and you get the demand for labor, okay? We call that the value of the marginal product. So the reason why the labor demand curve is downward sloping here is because the marginal product is downward sloping because of diminishing marginal productivity. In the more general case here, not only is the marginal product curve downward sloping, but the marginal revenue is, is decreasing as well, okay? So in this case, the demand for labor is steeper because it is the product of the downward sloping marginal product curve and the downward sloping marginal revenue. So what that means is the demand for labor falls more quickly because not only is marginal product going down, but also marginal revenue is going down. Okay, either way, assuming that the firm is operating in a perfectly competitive labor market, it can hire as many workers as it wants to at the going wage rate, okay? And so it takes its demand for labor, either here in the simple case or here in the more general case, okay? And it looks, it draws the downward sloping demand for labor, and then it looks how many at the going market wage rate, where does the wage intersect with that demand for labor? And that tells the firm how many people it's gonna hire, okay? For example, let me, now I will shift to the whiteboard because I can do a better job of showing you what's going on. This is actually more tedious. All right, so, There's our axis. This is the wage rate. This is the number of workers. The demand for labor is downward sloping. It's supposed to be downward sloping, right? So this is demand for labor. And then the firm says, okay, well, what's it cost me to hire workers? If this is the market wage rate, this is how many workers it will hire, L1. Okay, and again, to get back to the original question, the demand for labor is literally the marginal product for each worker, the marginal product times either the price of the, of the output or the marginal revenue of the output. Okay, now I know this is kind of hectic. Does anybody wanna ask questions about this before we go on? Okay, let me put it a little bit differently. All right, are we still in text mode? No, we're not. Text, color, blue. All right, if this is the demand curve for a firm that is selling its output in a perfectly competitive market, then, no, that's wrong. Apologies. Draw line blue. Then the demand for labor Oh, that did not work. 
the blue line would be the demand for labor that's selling its for a firm that's selling its output in imperfectly competitive markets. Okay, and the reason why is because, as I said before, their demand for labor falls faster. So what does that say about the number of workers that would be hired by an imperfectly competitive firm compared to a perfectly competitive firm? Amy, how about you? You should answer this. Can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, the, the question is, the red line is the demand for labor when you're selling your output in perfectly, a perfectly competitive market. The blue line is when you're selling your output in a market where you have some market power, so you're a monopolistically competitive firm, say. How, in the blue line case, how much, how many workers will you hire? According to the graph. Um, a lot. How many? Where on the graph? Where it intersects. It's gonna be right here. Yeah. Okay. Which turns out, you now why, okay. which it turns out is less than you would hire if you could sell your mark, your, your output in a competitive marketplace. Okay, so what this suggests is that say monopolies hire fewer workers than competitive firms do. But that actually makes sense because if you think back to monopoly, what we said is monopolies restrict their output so that they can charge a higher price. If they're producing less output, it would be natural for them to hire fewer workers. Okay, so another way to think about this is what we're seeing in the labor market graph is the flip side of what we're seeing in the product market graph that we did a couple of weeks ago. So the wage itself remained the same. Because, workers changed. yes, because the firm, in both cases, the firm is buying labor in a competitive labor market. So you can be a monopoly like Dominion Virginia Power, but when you hire entry-level secretaries, you pay what everyone else is paying for an entry-level secretary. Anybody have questions? Hey, Christine. All right, in that case, let's go on to the next question. You guys are a tough crowd tonight. I can't get you to, to laugh or anything. All right, the next question. How do you compute the marginal revenue product of labor? Well, we just did that. The marginal revenue product of labor is, hold on a second, M marginal revenue product of labor equals The marginal revenue product of labor is the second case here, okay? Um, so the demand for labor really has three different names. The, there's the basic demand for labor, and then there's the perfect, com perfectly competitive case, which we call the value of the marginal product of labor. And then we have the marginal revenue product of labor. They're all telling, they're all, they're all different ways of thinking about the demand for labor.
Okay. Now, the next question is a little more interesting, or sorry, a little more challenging. Um, the question is, how do you compute the marginal cost of labor? Okay. Marginal cost of anything is the change in the total cost of that thing. Okay. So let me show you something here. Use the whiteboard again. Let's see, which way do I? All right. Now, clear. Now, I want to go to another page, and I've done this before. Oh, maybe this thing. Aha, yes. Okay. All right. Now, um, let's suppose that you're a firm and you're operating in a perfectly competitive labor market just like in the last case, okay? In a perfectly competitive labor market, the firm can hire all the workers that it wants to, as long as it pay, it's willing to pay Let's see if I can do this. As long as it's willing to pay the market wage rate. Okay, so this is employment over here, right? So they have a horizontal labor supply curve. They can hire all the labor that they want to at the going market wage rate, all right? Now think about the information that, it's at, that is at every point on the labor supply curve here. Every point corresponds to two pieces of information. There's the wage rate, and there's the number of workers that you hire, right? If this was math, we could put this in parentheses and think of this as an ordered pair, right? But these are actually numbers. So the wage rate is gonna be like, like uh, $12 an hour, and employment is going to be like one, two, three, four, five, six workers. All right. So if that were the case, then let's see if I can do this. So L and W, L would be one, two, three, et cetera, and the wage rate is going to be 12, 12, 12. Now, if we multiply these two things together, we get the total cost of labor. If we hire one worker, the total cost is 12. If we hire two workers, the total cost is 24. If we hire three workers, the total cost is 36. Okay. How do we find the marginal cost of labor? Lily, got an idea? How do we find the marginal cost of labor? Marginal cost of labor? Yeah. How to find it? Yes. Um, Given these total cost numbers, how do you find the marginal cost? The difference between each? Exactly. So the first one costs you $12. How much does the second one cost? $12. $12. How much does the third one cost? $12. $12. The wage rate is $12. So this case is really simple, okay? 
but the general rule applies when you go to a more complicated case. So think about this one. Let me go, let's draw, and let's go back to blue. And I, I need to move this up a little bit. Okay. And then we will do draw with the squiggle. And this is employment, and this is the wage rate. But in this case, we're going to assume that the firm is not operating in a perfectly competitive labor market, but rather uh, an imperfectly competitive labor market, that really a normal labor market. In this case, what does the firm have to do to hire additional workers? Sierra? What does the firm have to do to get more workers? Um, lower the wage. Say that again. Lower the wage. Would more people be willing to work if the firm offered less money? Raise the wage. Exactly. It's a supply curve. It's a normally shaped supply curve. It's upward sloping. Okay. Now, okay, what this means is as we hire more workers, we have to pay a higher wage, not just to the new workers that we're hiring, but to all the workers, okay? And so instead of this being 12, 12, 12, maybe it's going to be... Let's see, 12, 15, and 20. And I'm just picking numbers to be simple. And we'll cross these numbers out. Okay, now when we wanna calculate the total cost of labor, 12 times one is 12, 15 times two is, 30, Twenty times three is sixty. Okay. Everybody see what I did there? Yeah, I'm just multiplying the number of workers times the wage rate you have to pay to get more of them. And then to calculate the marginal cost, Lily, what's the marginal cost of the second worker? The difference is eight. 28. 18, 28. sorry. 30 minus 12 is 18. What's the marginal cost of the, the uh, third worker? 30. 30. So what you should see here is marginal cost is rising really fast. It's rising faster than the wage is rising. So 12, 12, that's the same. But then we go 15, 18, 20, 30. So what we're saying here is the marginal cost of labor is going to look up, is going to be up here. Okay, in the simple case here, the supply of labor and the marginal cost of labor were the same thing because the wage doesn't change. In this case, because you have to raise the wage to get more workers, the marginal cost grows faster. So you don't divide the, the marginal cost of labor by the number of employees. That would give you the new wage rate, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you have the rule here is that you have to pay everybody the same amount. So if you pay, if you're only hiring one person, you can get somebody for cheap. If you want five people, you have to pay them all more in order to get five. Oh, that's true. Okay. 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 That's wrong. okay. 
So this is the situation that monopsonies face. Because if they're the only employer in the market, then to get more workers, they're, they're facing the whole market. They have to pay a higher price to get more workers, right? So, so what we would do is now, let's do, let's do this, except I want a blue line. Here's our demand for labor. Okay. So we're talking about a monopsonist. They're the only employer. They can pay any wage they want to, but they want to maximize their profits. So they want to hire the right number of workers. If they want to maximize their profits, then what they're gonna to wanna to do, let me pick another color here, is they're gonna to wanna to go to this spot right here. This is the marginal revenue product, which is the marginal revenue. And they wanna choose the level, the number of workers where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. So that puts them right here. Now here's the punchline, which is, which is kind of nasty. What, what's the wage rate that they pay? Where is the wage on the graph? It's quite high up the graph. If they want this many workers, it's the supply of labor, right? That tells them what they have to pay. So they can get that many workers by paying this wage rate, which is lower than would be the case if the firm was not the only employer. So the competitive wage rate is up here. The monopsonist says, hey, you want a job? You got to work for me. This is what I'm paying. And I'm, I'm sorry if it's less than you want. That's just the way it is. So the first one, the, the intersection. Oh, here? The dot. That is the market. That's what the market, if you went across. No, that would right market. here is the market equilibrium, right here. Okay. So what is There's the supply and demand equal? Okay. Okay. What the monopsony does is they hire less workers. And because they're hiring fewer workers, they can get away with paying them a lower wage because they're the only employer. So what's the, the big dot? This one here? Yes, sir. This just tells you how many workers you want to hire. Okay, so that's the number of workers, not the yeah. wage. If you think about uh, the, the, the normal case in the output market, okay. this circle told us what output we wanted to supply. And then we went up to the demand curve to figure out the price, the charge. Okay. Here, the circle tells us how many workers we want to employ, and then we go down to the supply of labor curve to figure out what to pay them. Okay. So the first circle, the, the big one on, uh, yeah, that one, um, is that your profit ma maximization there? Yes. Okay. That defines profit maximization. Mm -hmm. So what this says is you're hiring the right number of workers in order to maximize your profit. Yeah. But because of monopoly, they're always going to yeah. uh, juice below. Okay. Yep. Well Perfect. done for a historian. <laughs> I got there eventually. Yeah. Okay, other questions? This is really not where I thought we would be tonight, but that's okay. All right. If that's going to work. Oh, I made that disappear. That was not my intent. Okay, no, that's not my intent either. Okay. Um, oh, this is, this is actually good timing. So the, the last question here, in fact, let, let's go back to our... Just one second, I'm sorry. So this... The second graph that you see me pointing at the screen, 
Um, the second graph that we just drew, that is when it is not a competitive market. I mean, it's a competitive, it's an imperfect. In the labor market, in the labor market, yes. So this is, the, this is Mary Washington Hospital hiring intensive care nurses. Okay. They're the only employer, so they have power. Okay. Okay, now the last question, and this is kind of ironic, is um, this was from a self-check. In a blank output market, employment will be higher than in a blank output market. Um, that was actually a question that we talked about a few, a few minutes ago. If you're in a competitive market, do you hire more workers or less workers than if you're in a, in an, uh, if you're a monopoly, say? Do monopolies hire more workers or less workers than would be hired in a competitive market? Remember this? If you're in a competitive market, this is where you operate. If you sell output in a competitive market, if you're a monopsonist, no, sorry, if you're a monopolist, this is where you operate. And so imperfect competition, whether it's on the input side or the output side, results in fewer jobs. Okay, in this case, we go from L, the red L1 to L, and in the, that's the monopoly case in the, in the, where did it go? I lost my page. I can't get back. No. Oh, well. Um, in the other case, it's monopsony. All right. Any other questions before we move on? And that's, so that's the imperfect competition. So that's if it's monopolistic and if it's, Yes, or oligopoly. Anything but for perfect competition puts you on the blue blue line here. Okay, so but that's true whether it's you said it was true going in and out. So it's true. It's true whether on the on the now this we're looking at the at imperfect competition. We're looking at monopsony or imperfect competition in the labor market. So there is either one employer or there are few employers. The competitive employment would occur right here where supply equals demand. But when the firm has, when the employer has market power, they end up hiring fewer workers, just like in the previous case here, where they end up hiring fewer workers. Okay. So competition is good for jobs. And imperfect competition is better for employers. Okay, any questions, other questions? All right. In that case, let's go on to talking about externalities, okay? Um, we may not have time to cover all of this tonight. And if that's the case, we'll just continue next week. So. Okay, so what are externalities? What does that mean, externality? Mac, any ideas? We talked about this in macro last semester. I don't know. What's an externality? Um, things outside of a company. What do you mean outside? Externally. <laughs> okay, that's a good start to an answer. Okay, um, 
what it means, uh, the easiest way to think about externalities is they are side effects, okay? So there are positive externalities where other people benefit from your actions and there are negative externalities where other people are harmed from your actions, okay? Both of them are a problem because if you don't take the externalities into account, we end up with an inefficient allocation of resources, meaning the market is not supplying the right amount of stuff. The amount, it's not supplying the amount to meet consumers' demands. Okay, so let's... Just, uh, yep. just, just to clarify, you said it can lead to allocative inefficiencies. Correct, yes. Yeah, okay, I got okay. you. Um, so, with a positive externality, we say that the marginal benefit to society at large exceeds the marginal benefit to the person make, doing, uh, taking the action, making the decision. So the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal private benefit. Okay, which is another way of saying that you take an action and other people benefit from that action. So the total benefit to society of your action is bigger than the benefit that you perceive because it's bigger than the benefit that you get. Similarly, a negative externality is when the marginal cost to society at large is greater than the marginal cost to the person taking the action. So the marginal social cost is greater than the marginal private cost. Okay. Now this sounds abstract, but it's really practical. Okay, the problem in both, with both positive and negative externalities is people make decisions based only on the benefits and the costs that they see. They don't account for the full benefits and costs that they're either giving or imposing on the rest of the world around them. Okay, here's a good example, a very timely example. Why, why are we supposed to be practicing social distancing? What's, what is the, the point of social distancing? Salid, you were smiling. Why, why are we supposed to do social distancing? Um. <laughs> so the virus don't get worse. Okay. Yes, but but tell me more about that. Okay. Um. Well. The point is not. The the, the point is not that by social distancing, you protect yourself from the virus. That's not the point. What is the point? Uh, to decrease the amount of, well, to protect others? Exactly, exactly. So the reason why, the reason why it's a policy is not to protect you, but to protect everyone else. Because if you, if you stay away from people, you're less likely to catch the virus, which protects you. That's your benefit from social distancing. But everyone around you also benefits because they won't catch the virus from you. So the benefit to society is far greater than the benefit. I'm good. Yep. All right. <laughs> you guys are weird. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, I think I'm going to stop at this point.
and we will continue next week before we get into reviewing for the exam. Um, remember, if you haven't already, please make an appointment for test corrections. Um, and think about what you need help with for the final and uh, ask those questions next Wednesday and I will help you to the best of my ability. All right. Our final is cumulative from day one. It is. And it is what date? Next. It is next Monday. I, I checked again and it's Monday. Monday the? Uh, May 1st. May 1st. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Sure. Other questions? Isn't that a Friday? Um, when I, when I looked, somebody, somebody said it, it, oh, that's good. Somebody, you know, I thought it was Friday, but when I checked the registrar's website, it turns out it's Monday. Okay. If that's going to be a huge problem for you, let me know and I can make special arrangements for you. I have that it's a Friday <laughs> on my calendar. I know, I know, I know. So is it? Well, it's supposed to be Monday, according to the registrar. So the 27th? Yes. No, not the 27th. Mon Monday is the first, isn't it? No. I don't think so. Okay. Well, then I'm, okay, I'm totally confused. Um, Everyone's I, confused at the minute. Yes, the world yes. in not in yes. turn. So I will figure it out, and I will, I will send, make an announcement and let you guys know. Okay. For all I know, I was looking at the wrong year. All right, other questions? Uh, I just had a question about test corrections, but I can do that once everybody leaves. I was just, okay, sure. so, yeah. Yeah, fine. Anybody else? Susie, what's for dinner in your house? Huevos Rancheros. Oh, que bueno. All right, well, I'm going to turn off the recording.